Good evening YouTube and welcome to another video. Um, I must apologise firstly that it's not another Pi Camera video. Real life has gone in the way as it so often does and uh, Pi Camera, which is not paid work, has had to take a back seat for a bit. But an interesting bit of paid work did come across my desk recently, uh, debugging the distance sensor in GPIO Zero. And this turned out to be quite a complex debugging affair this morning. Um, and so I thought it would make an interesting video, if only for my own sake as much as others, uh, to see the process of debugging the hardware and the software behind it. The other apology I must make up front is that my voice is not in the best of form. Um, I've been rather ill recently, so hopefully it will survive through this recording, but we'll see. Um, anyway, without further ado, let's have a look at the setup that we've got to play with. Uh, let's get some better light over here. So this is your typical breadboard with the ultrasonic distance sensor on it. Uh, the ultrasonic distance sensor is a 5 volt component, so we've got 5 volts coming through the red wire here onto the distance sensor. The white wire is the ground line. The yellow cable here is the trigger. Now despite the fact that it's a 5 volt component and we're running this straight off the GPIO pins, and the GPIO pins are 3.3 volts, that's sufficient to drive um, the trigger. We don't need any more from that. The issue comes when it comes to the echo pin. The echo pin is driven at 5 volts by the sensor and we want to read that on the Pi. Obviously we can't shove 5 volts down a GPIO pin back to the Pi, so we need a voltage divider, which is what these two resistors down here are for. Let's see if I can get some better light here. Well, that's what I have to do. Uh, maybe I can move that up a bit. Here we go. So this bottom resistor here is a 330 ohm, and that goes between the echo pin on the sensor and the GPIO pin that we're connecting it to. And that top resistor is a 470 ohm, which goes between ground and the GPIO pin we're connecting it to. So that forms a voltage divider with a ratio of uh, 330 over 470 plus 330, which is 800. So we've got a ratio of 470 over 800, 47 over 80, and that gives us about 3 volts out. It, we don't have to be precise with these things. 3 volts is sufficient to drive the GPIO input. So that's good enough for our purposes. Now you may note that this isn't plugged directly into the Pi. This is plugged into Pi Moroni's lovely Black Hat hacker board. And that's because I want to attach something else so I can watch what's going on on the pins. Remember what I said that uh, this is going to be a bit of hardware and software debugging. The first thing you should always debug before attacking your software is your hardware. Make sure your hardware is doing what you expect. So attached to the bottom row of pins, which are like the, the GPI pins on the Pi, I've got the breadboard and sensor. Attached to the top row, I've got this rather nasty little device which is over here, this is a Bitscope Micro, which is a very small, very cheap oscilloscope. Fabulous for debugging these little things, <coughs> because this will enable us to see exactly what's going on on the pins in real time, and trace it, and look at uh, how the echo pin varies as we move a reflector in front of the, uh, the distance sensor. Um, so you can see it's wired to I don't know if you can see that, I'll try and get closer again. That's wired to the same pins on the top here that the echo and trigger are wired to on the bottom here. These match, basically. So, now that we've had a look at the hardware, let's see what happens on the Pi with the current version of GPIO Zero. So here's the Pi. I've got a clone of the GPIO Zero repository. Uh, on the right here, we've got the distance sensor code as it currently stands in master. That's the, the, the current top of the repository. And on the left here, I've got a nice little test script that I've just whipped up uh, that simply imports distance sensor, imports sleep, sets up a distance sensor on pins 24 and 23. That's the echo pin on 24 and the trigger pin on 23 and goes into a loop that simply prints out the sensor distance in meters and sleeps for a tenth of a second. So let's uh, actually let's leave that there so we can see it. 
and fire up another console and we'll run that and see what happens with the current version of the code. The um, the activity that people have been complaining about is uh, that apparently this starts up and doesn't show anything for a while but when it does show something it just shows the maximum value. So that's what we're expecting to see here. Oops, test find four. So we've started up. Doesn't seem to be much happening. Wait and wait and wait. So that's a long period of doing nothing apparently. And eventually <laughs> Yes, it's a long wait. Good lord. There we go. There we go. Printing value suddenly. So, we've confirmed the bug. When we start it up, it takes an absolute age, displaying nothing, and then suddenly just displays the maximum distance, which is currently set to one meter. What's going on? Let's, let's go and have a look at the oscilloscope. I'll bring in the oscilloscope in the top right here so we can see what's going on with the pins. Um, now we want to set that to repeat so we can see what's going on. Uh, we've got that at one millisecond per division. We're on logic mode. Um, just to go through what's, uh, what you can see in the oscilloscope here. Uh, we're in logic mode, so instead of looking at a, a wave, we're, uh, at a, an analog wave essentially, we're going to be looking at uh, several digital waves. Um, there are eight digital inputs for logic analysis. The ones we're interested in here are the bottom one, the white one, that's tied to the trigger pin, <coughs> and the brown one above it is tied to the echo pin. You can ignore all the rest if you see anything on them, it doesn't matter. <coughs> What we ought to see, if things are functioning correctly, is a brief blip on the trigger pin, followed by a longer blip on the echo pin. So let's run that script again and see what we get. Note that during the long delay, we're already seeing trigger and echo, trigger and echo. Ignore the blue line up here, I don't know why that's mirroring the, the echo pin. What's important is the trigger pin is blipping. Uh, we're triggering on the trigger pin. Confusing terminology. <coughs> Which is why that's aligned to the left. And we're seeing the echo pin after it. So even though the script doesn't appear to be doing anything, now it does, <coughs> the sensor was still firing. Well, that tells us a few things. It tells us that everything's wired up correctly. It tells us that the sensor is the sensor hardware is doing more or less what we expect. Um, it's triggering, and it's sending back an echo. Does that echo vary according to a reflector that we place in front of it? Let's run the script again, and I'm going to move uh, my mobile phone in front of. Actually, let's uh, let me bring up that and then you can see me moving that. You can just about see that. You can see as I move it closer the echo time gets shorter and as I move it away the echo time gets longer. Okay, so we've confirmed from that The hardware is indeed operational. The hardware seems to be wired up correctly. It's being triggered um, and it's showing an echo that is proportional to the distance of the reflector in front of it. So there must be something wrong with the software. Now we've confirmed that the hardware is fine, we can attack the software. So let's get to it. Let's have a look at what could be going on. First of all, let's try and figure out why there's that enormous long pause at the start. At this point it's helpful to understand what sort of sensor GPIO0 sees the distance sensor as. Now if we scroll up here we can have a look at what it derives from. Distance sensor derives from smoothed input device. That's a bit of a hint. Smoothed input devices are not considered like digital devices. Whenever they're instantiated they fire up a background thread 
and that background thread constantly polls the sensor, filling a queue with values from the sensor, and the average of those values is reported as the value of the sensor. So as soon as we instantiate distance sensor, it will be starting a background thread which will be constantly triggering the distance sensor, which is what we saw on the oscilloscope. Here we can see some of the default settings for the queue, and the important ones are QLEN30 and partial false. QLEN30 means that it needs to fill 30 values in the queue, or well, the queue is 30 values long at maximum, and partial false means that it won't report any values at all until the queue is full. For the sake of, um, if you want accurate readings, then you want to ensure that you have a, a good number to, to average before you start reporting any. You can set that to true, of course, and you, then you can immediately read values, but the initial values are not guaranteed to be as accurate as the later ones. So that's why the defaults are what they are. The queue length is quite long because the distance sensor is generally quite jittery. Uh, well, I say it's quite jittery, the hardware itself actually isn't that jittery. It's more that we're dealing with this on a real-time operating system in a high-level language that makes it jittery. Um, but glossing over that, that's why we have such a long queue there. Now, that long delay that we observed at the start of the script seemed about 30 seconds or so. So the fact that we've got a queue length of 30 is a little suspicious. Let's go and look at the bit that actually reads the sensor. That's further down under the read method. Looking at this, we can see it starts off by making sure that the echo pin is low, make sure that we're not getting any false readings from a prior echo. We then blip the trigger for a very short period, I think it's uh, 10 microseconds, Actually, it'll probably be longer than 10 microseconds, but it doesn't matter. It, all that matters is that the trigger is high for at least 10 microseconds. And then we wait up to one second for the echo pin to rise. Hmm. That's an interesting one. So if the echo pin doesn't rise, or if it doesn't think it rises, it's going to wait a full second. So imagine if it thought the echo pin never rose, and it took, therefore, 30 seconds to read 30 values from the sensor. That would explain that initial wait, because it won't start reporting values until that queue is full. So we can, take, we can posit a guess at this point that, for some reason, it's not seeing that echo pin rise. Let's pop in a print statement here and see if our, our theory is reasonable. Echo pin did not rise. Let's pop back over here, run that, and see what happens. Oh, look, echo pin did not rise, echo pin did not rise. Now, we know from the oscilloscope that that's not true. We saw the echo pin rising and falling. So why is it thinking that the echo pin isn't rising and falling? Well, let's look at what it's actually looking for. It's looking for echo weight. What is self dot underscore echo? What is that? Let's go back to the constructor. It's an event. This is a threading primitive that you can wait on and which can be set or cleared. And you basically wait for it to be set. So where is this event set? Well, it's set in the pin callback. So when the pin rises or falls, we're looking at both edges on the pin here, this callback should be called. If we haven't recorded an echo rise time, we record it, and otherwise we record the echo fall time. And then, regardless of either case, we set the echo event, and the reason that's regardless is to ensure that that read method always returns, regardless of what happens. So it looks like, if that's called at all, the echo event must be set. But we know the echo event isn't being set. So we can surmise from that that the callback is not being called. But we're definitely setting it. self.pin.winChanged equals callback. Now, 
if that bit didn't work, I know that several other bits of the library wouldn't work either. Uh, the light sensor wouldn't work, the buttons wouldn't work, all sorts of really quite common things wouldn't work. And if those didn't work, we'd be getting a lot more complaints. So maybe there's something different about these. Actually, this morning when I was debugging this, this was the point where I wired up a button just to make sure I wasn't going absolutely insane and check that the button really did work, and of course it did. <coughs> I skipped that little bit of debugging here because this video is going to be long enough as it is. Let's go and look at the other when changed instances to see how they differ from this one. Here's another when changed. This is in the light sensor, and here again we're we're setting another event. It's a little it's a little simpler this time. We're just setting the event handler itself to the set method on on the event object. Okay. Nothing terribly different there then. Let's go and look at another one. Um, here's the one for digital input device, which is the ancestor of button. Uh, this calls the internal self.fire events. Uh, if we go and look at that method, this is a thing that, um, that deals with all the events behind the wait for methods. So when you call button.waitfor press, button.waitfor release, uh, fire events is the thing that handles setting all the things that operate with that. But again, not much difference. Self top pin dot when changed equals some method. Back to our distance sensor one. Well, there is one subtle difference. It's not being set to a method, it's being set to a function. Could that be the difference? This is where um, even the subtle differences are worth exploring. So let's go and have a look at what happens when we set when changed. Um, I happen to know it's not a, a simple property, um, but it's generally worth noting that Python does have calculated properties, and therefore even if you see something being set, there could be a little more going on behind the scenes than you expect. Now, at this point, we need to know which pin library we're interfacing with. As it happens, we're just using the default RPI GPIO. So we need to go and get the RPI GPIO interface in GPIO 0. Here we are. Let's go looking for when changed stuff. Uh, nothing terribly interesting there. Setting bounce, so on and so forth. Ah, now here's some bits. Call when changed. Enable event detect, disable event detect. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. These aren't directly associated with setting when changed. So we probably need to look a little further down the hierarchy, but we're getting close. What does this descend from? This descends from local pipe-in. What's that got? Not much. Okay, let's go down to pipe-in. Ah, now we're here. Get when changed, set when changed. So get when changed is very basic, but set when changed has quite a bit in it. We're acquiring a lock. The only reason for that is to ensure we don't go around messing with um, event detection things, which often involve background threads in our underlying libraries. Uh, we don't go messing around with those in the middle of other threads. When setting it to none, we disable event detection. Fine, nothing terribly special there. But down here, there's something interesting. There's a note that I've left. Have to take care of value is either a closure or a... Let's, uh, read the rest of that. Either a closure or a bound method not to keep a strong reference to the containing object. What's all this about? What this means is instead of storing just the reference to the handler, we're storing a weak reference to the handler. And there's some uh, jiggery-pokery to do with whether it's a method or a function. That, that particularly doesn't really matter here, uh, even though that's what got us here in the first place. That's not actually what matters. What matters is we're keeping a weak reference. What is a weak reference and why are we using them? Well, there was a problem a while back uh, with GPIO 0's use at the REPL, at the, uh, the interactive Python command line, and also during shutdown of scripts involving composite objects. That composite objects were keeping around references which wound up being circular. Uh, if you can imagine there is, uh, let's say, a sensor object 
and it references a pin and the pin references an event handler and the event handler references the, back to the sensor <clears throat> so now you have this nice circular set of, of things referencing each other which the garbage collector can't easily deal with and this really gets in the way when you're playing around with things at the REPL or when you're dealing with composite objects made of other objects which is a, a fairly common pattern within the GPI0 library so this was an issue that we needed to fix. It's not something that the users should have to deal with, memory management and so on. It's meant to be a simple library for educational purposes. Uh, and getting into memory management is really not something you want to be dealing with in an educational setting. So we fixed it by using these weak references down at the pin level. However, this does mean that when you write um, a, an event handler for a pin up in a sensor class, and not something users would do, but something GPI Zero developers have to do, you have to be aware that the pin itself will not keep your handler alive. It does not have a strong reference to it, it has a weak reference to it. So it's up to you to keep the strong reference to it. With all this in mind, we should now have an idea of what's going on. So let's go back and look at the distance sensor code. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, yes, it was a function as opposed to a method, but the more important thing is it's a local function. So after this dunder init method finishes, that local function is going to disappear. If this was a strong reference, it wouldn't, because that strong reference would keep it around. But it's not a strong reference, it's a weak reference implicitly. So that callback is going to disappear. What happens when it disappears? Let's go back and look at pi.py. When it's called, um, there's a little bit of jiggery-pokery here again, which I should explain. This call here is not actually calling the when changed handler. When you have a weak reference, you call the weak reference to find out what it actually references. And if the reference has disappeared, it returns none. So that call there is not calling the method itself. It's just checking whether the reference is still alive. And if it's not alive, it sets when changed to none. It gets rid of that handler, which it will also implicitly disable event detection. So this is what's going on. This is assigned as the callback, dunder it finishes, the callback disappears, and then the first time it's called, when changed is set back to none. Let's confirm this hypothesis. In read, let's print um, self dot pin dot when changed. The very first time this is called, we should see that it's the weak reference, but the second time we should see that's changed to none. Actually, let's print the wrapper of that. And there we go. Oops, let's scroll back just to see that. There's our weak reference. Echo pin rise, and then thereafter, it's none. So now we know what's going on. We've figured it out. Let's get rid of all our changes. and fix things. I'm going to take our callback. Uh, let's pop it down here. And let's pop that back there. And then call that ooh, echo changed, let's say. And because it's now a method, it needs a self parameter. Uh, then if we pop back to the dunder init method, that now needs to be self dot when changed uh, autocomplete <laughs> autocomplete works very nicely on a big fat core i7 but on a pi it's a little bit slow have to wait a bit for that to appear I repair my voice with a cup of tea right there we go 
Now, <coughs> now that we've got that, let's see what happens with our test script. Why did I call that when changed? And that should be echo change, shouldn't it? Silly me. Right. Now that looks a little more promising. That looks much more like a distance measurement. Let's bring up the oscilloscope and watch what's going on. So this is with my hand uh, about 10 centimeters in front of it. And I can bring it further forward and further back and you can see the echo changing accordingly. So that's very, very nice. That's exactly what we'd expect to see. Trigger, echo, trigger, echo, trigger, echo. Now you can see it's bouncing around a fair bit, which brings us to another issue that was reported mm, sort of in ancillary comments to these tickets, that it's possible for the distance sensor to get a bit confused about prior echoes interacting with current echoes. So it's safest to leave a fairly large gap between each trigger and um, <coughs> and therefore ensure that you're not seeing the results of prior echoes in the current one. Very, very simple fix for this one. Uh, reading the spec sheets, it seems that one should leave 60 milliseconds between each read. Um, there's a rather nice sample weight parameter that we call on our ancestor and we can set that to 0 0.06 which is 60 milliseconds and that will ensure that there will be 60 milliseconds oh you can't see that sorry I've left the bit scope in the way here we go um, yes in distant sensor there is this ancestor parameter sample weight if we set that to 0 0.06 it was 0 originally then we will have a, a 60 millisecond delay between each read and things should be a little more accurate. Let's bring the bitscope back and try running that. Now we should see that there's only a single read really appearing on the scope each time. I've put the reflector back in front of the sensor and moving it back and moving it forward. Actually let's Let's see that in reality as well. So I've got a big box set of DVDs here, which I'm using as a reflector. And that's them moving towards the sensor and away. Turn that around a bit. There we go. Just about see that moving forwards and backwards. And the oscilloscope showing the the resulting echo pulse, which is rather nice. So we've debugged the problem, we've fixed the software, and all that remains now is to tidy up, write some more tests, do a bit of documentation, and we should all be done. So hopefully that was an enjoyable little exploration of the distance sensor in GPI Zero and everybody can look forward to a, a slightly better functioning one in the next release, which should be fairly shortly. Uh, there do remain some issues with using the distance sensor remotely over a Pi GPIO um, socket. That's mainly th um, that is scheduled as much as these things are scheduled to be fixed in 1.5. Um, but that's out of scope for this particular one. This, this needs a, a quick fix to, to get distance sensor working again for the masses. Um, but hopefully you've enjoyed this. I uh, look forward to any comments. And hopefully uh, I'll get back to some Pi camera videos for you in the future. Until then, thank you very much. Bye-bye.